Welcome to uh, today's panel, uh, Lessons from the Great Emu War, a family perspective. <laughs> now, who among us has been affected by the Great Emu War? Many of you need to Google that, it's very funny. Long story short, the emus won. Uh, much like the emu, we too have a long and arduous battle that we must succeed. With me today are three fantastic organizers who much like those brave and victorious emu generals will lead us to victory! Indeed, indeed. I will now let them introduce themselves. <laughs> Beginning from me to the left, Debbie. I have to do the same thing. <laughs> to the east. <laughs> Hello. I'm Debbie Goddard. I work at American Atheists as the Vice President for Programs. Now, I will be giving a little bit of commentary on each one of the speakers or their organizations. So, I met Debbie at Skepta 3 or Skepta 4, I don't remember which, and Debbie was wearing a sweater vest. I was also wearing a sweater vest. I said, hi, you're wearing a sweater vest, can we be friends? Debbie said yes, and it has now been 10 years. It's a true story. We are both better for it. Kevin. Uh, I'm Kevin Bowling. I'm the executive director of the Secular Student Alliance. Fun fact, I came <laughs> into the secular movement through the Secular Student Alliance. This is the first time I've met Kevin because I have not been a student in some time. I'm old. Today is my birthday. Happy birthday! How old? I am 31. Oh my gosh. It's old! It feels old. Mm. You wait. You wait. Right. <laughs> Nadia. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nadia Dutchen. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the executive director of the American Humanist Association. This is also my first time meeting Nadia, uh, even though we both spend time in similar things, but in different time periods. We both lived in Minnesota, mm -hmm. in, and uh, we were both briefly environmentalists. <laughs> Environmentalism made me sad. It does. I gave up. <laughs> that is true. But, our brilliant emu war generals will lead us to victory in secularism. Please tell me, considering the troubles, how have your organizations shifted? What are some things that you're happy about? Or what are your plans to better address this world post the troubles? Mm -hmm. looking at you. Oh, no, no. I mean, I, it I doesn't have to be Debbie, Debbie, but everyone is looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> because you're lovely, Debbie. Because you're lovely. <laughs> the group mind has decided. I, I answered that for a bit yesterday, so I figured someone else should go first. I, I can go. So, I'll start. Uh, since I'm, I think I'm the newest one here, so uh, it's been interesting. I joined the AHA in December of last year, and it was a bit of a shocker, to say the least. Uh, not in a bad way. There are lots of opportunities. Uh, for the organization. Um, I think one of the things that we're really excited about in the coming year is working across, uh, I guess, interfaith gaps and chasms that we have. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world, and we're, as like I need to tell you that, uh, we're losing our rights wholesale. Uh, and so we, we've got more in common with people outside of the secular movement than we think we do. Uh, so leading into interfaith work uh, is going to be really key to us, to, to our success in the next year or so. Um, so we're looking forward to building those partnerships, but one of the most pleasant things that um, I've discovered in the last six months is working more closely with these folks, uh, folks within our own uh, secular movement. Apparently we didn't play well in the sandbox together for many years, I, I, so I heard. Uh, so we're doing that, and we're doing it really well. We just did our lobby day with uh, American Atheists, which was really successful. We're planning a huge thing in the next four years together, which is still kind of embargoed. Um, but working to deepen our relationship with young people in particular, given the fact that my background is in youth movement building. Uh, so I'm looking forward to like really, really cuddling up with Kevin 
and the SSA and the camps uh, and Go Humanity and all of the other wonderful young people in the secular movement and really building those partnerships um, so that we can do our work together. I think coalition work is really, really important. I think you've heard that over and over again already this weekend and we're only a day into it. Um, but coalition work is what's gonna make this, make this, this machine go. Um, and so we're, I'm really, really excited about that. And I've been with the Secular Student Alliance for about five years now. Um, and uh, when I was hired, part of my job was actually moving the office. The board had already decided this and said, hey, we want to move the office. And so one candidate was on the East Coast, and I live in Los Angeles, so to Los Angeles it came. Um, so the national office is now located in Los Angeles, um, but the really the heart of the organization and, and the lifeblood of the organization is really the students. Um, and so we have chapters all across the United States. We've always had a really strong presence in college universities um, and an increasing, there's always been a good number, like a good handful of high school student chapters. Um, but we've seen that really starting to grow in the last, well, minus COVID, um, but in the last few years. And then the, also the interest in, in middle schools. So we did have our first middle school chapter start in Utah uh, pre-COVID. Uh, um, and so that's sort of great things to see is that we know this younger and younger generation is becoming more and more active. Um, and so the statistics, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that we're talking, you know, one in five of the general population was non-religious, one in four, and now we're almost one in three. For students, we're almost at 50% of young people in the United States are non-religious. And so we saw talking about this generation actually could be the tipping point where we're majority non-religious rather than majority religious. Um, and so if the trends continue the way they are, we hope to see that. Um, but our chapters are really, they're, in, you know, uh, they're involved on their own campuses. Almost all of our chapters look very different depending on where they are and who the leadership is and what they're doing. And we embrace that. We want them to be autonomous and make their own decisions and, and do their own programming. Uh, COVID for students, as with many people, was very difficult. Um, and so the majority of our students, we know about 80% of our students come from religious families. And so when, clo when schools closed in March of 20, they oftentimes left their secular communities and their secular friends and the programs that they were doing and that sense of, of fr you know, friendship and family that they had created and went home most times to religious families and religious communities. Um, and so we completely changed everything that we did in the national office and switched within a week, switched all of our programming to virtual. We did, typically didn't do a lot of programming nationally to the students and that completely changed and that's something that we're continuing to do. We will always, so we have some uh, semesterly webinars that we do and we have student meetings that we do monthly and all of that will continue. Uh, we were very chapter focused, so individual student organizations on individual campuses and schools. Um, and we also, through the COVID, realized that there's a bunch of students who don't have chapters or are online school or in a community where there's just not a possibility to do that. Um, we even have some homeschooling students. And so we're creating a platform now for individual students to be involved, feel like they have an online community, um, and then really sort of help them get active in uh, activism and however they see that out. Um, and also one of the things that we really see is our students are obviously separation of church and stays important and non-religion is important, um, but they're also in women's, women's reproductive health and LGBT rights and uh, environmentalism and I mean just name the list of it and I, our stickers at the table for you to help yourself, uh, but to give you an idea of the things that our students are interested in, that's what we use to guide us. So yes, we're a secular organization, but we really let the passions of the students guide where we go. Um, we're fortunate to have great relationships with many in the secular movement, and a lot of local groups all across the country who help support the students as well. So that's super, super important to us. I have a question for you real fast. Yeah. How many questions do you have? Uh, I have six, six uh, intending to be fairly conversational. All right. As you know, I'm pretty good on my feet. <laughs> it's true. Uh, yeah, I didn't want to recap um, everything I went over yesterday. If I did a brief overview, because uh, a lot of you weren't here yesterday. Where were you? Um, <laughs> Assume they are not. Assume you're not. 
we're talking about what what's been going on recently and what's what's coming up in the future. Mm -hmm. So American Atheists has grown a lot in the last few years, staff-wise and program-wise. And one of the biggest areas that we've invested resources and built capacity is working on state policy. The secular landscape, the the movement organizations, the the Secular Coalition for America member orgs, I think in the last few years, maybe motivated by Trump's election, I don't know, um, and some changes in leadership and whatnot, like in new hires, it's just like, let's work better together. If, if one organization is kind of doing this well and they've got nine or 11 lawyers and this one has two, like we don't need to try to do the same amount of litigation work. So for example, uh, my colleague Allison Gill at American Atheists worked, made a lawyer cabal, cabal with other lawyers from secular organizations, and they divvy things up sometimes. And we made a memorandum of understanding that for some of the um, potential legal cases that come in uh, to American Atheists, because we have two lawyers and they have many more than that at Freedom From Religion Foundation, um, we send stuff to them. And we let some of the people who contact us know, like, you know, oh, you have this, this thing that's happening in your town with the police vehicles and God we trust. FFRF does that all the time. They'll send the letter, they'll do the follow-up. They've got nine lawyers. I don't know how many lawyers they have, but it's a bigger number than two. Meanwhile, American Atheists is more focused on policy, making model bills, getting state advocacy teams together. Um, that's a new thing in our community, like having committed networks of state activists who can push bills, but also react and also like pay attention to what's going on in their area based on their interests. We don't tell them they they tell us like what, what they want to work on and we help them write testimony and you know reach out to groups and, and build their lists and things like that, create relationships, partners, coalitions. So that's that's where we focused. One of our new positions last year was a state policy manager position to focus on this, to help train up our grassroots and whatnot. We also have a network of volunteer state directors and assistant state directors. Not in every state, but it's growing. Uh, Sam McGuire, can't help but point, over there, uh, who's tabling, is our national field director, so talk to her if you're interested uh, in more information there. And Devin Graham works out of Tallahassee, Florida, doing a lot of the exemplary volunteer things that we like to see on the ground grassroots activists do. That's been a big part of it. I was hired at the end of 2018 partly to help develop our community and grassroots programs. And yes, some of that is getting people involved in activism, but a big part of it too is just like, what are the needs of atheists out there? Of course, things went real sideways once quarantine hit because things looked real different for a lot of people. The, the tools we had, we all, not just American atheists, but atheists had for community support that we were used to, including just having in-person gatherings and support meetings. Like everything had to move online and a lot of people had to deal with situations that were challenging and some groups haven't survived and some groups have been really effective at changing. So things are kind of uh, coming out of that now. And we worked with a lot of different groups to help provide um, support and share information. And it was interesting to see all kinds of humanist and atheist groups out there do like making hand sanitizer to donate or masks. Meanwhile, there's protests and things going out there. And so we saw people getting involved in all kinds of issues that were happening in their area as like legit community groups, whether that be Black Lives Matter or um, homelessness and, and other issues, um, which was really exciting to see in a big difference. And one other thing to say, and I don't need to say it right now because it just slipped out of my brain. Time. Something, something, we, we community group, something, something, together. working together, <laughs> something, something, advocacy. Well, <laughs> so I that's fine. Interested. That's about, that's, uh, yeah. that's it, yeah. Uh, two of you talked a little bit about the niche your organization is in and moving into. I'm interested, uh, how is AJ historically, what niche do you think you served and what do you want to move into? Mm, so, I am new to humanism altogether. Uh, so I'm coming from outside of the movement, so my perspective is very different. Um, when I joined the organization, actually when I was applying for my job, uh, the movement is very talky. <laughs> I don't have a better word for it. There's a lot of talking happening. Um, and, and I think it's important that we have intellectual discourse, but I don't think that that should be the grounding of our work. Um, it is not work at all, it's talking. 
Um, and so that has been the basic tenor and tone of humanism through the AJ to some degree. I'm, you know, I don't want to throw many of our chapters. We've got wonderful, some really wonderful chapters that are vibrant and active, um, but that has not been the general case. Uh, and so what we're gonna see, what you will hopefully see in the next um, 12 months or so, is you'll start to see our chapters move into a more uh, active vibrancy. Um, if we are not serving with humanism, what are we doing? We're doing it wrong. Um, so we're gonna be moving away from all of the chit chat about the enlightenment and all of the wonderful things uh, that happened in the, when was it, 16th century, 17th? I don't know. <laughs> old people, very old people. Um, <laughs> whenever it happened, uh, it was lovely and it was wonderful, but it, is, it doesn't serve us today. Uh, humanism is meant to lift up people. Uh, so we will be shifting into a more tactile uh, and tactical uh, organization where we are actually serving uh, in a meaningful ways uh, and ameliorating the human s situation. Um, and this will not be performative by any stretch. Um, you know, I said that we had our, our heads meeting in, in March and I think I pissed off some people. Not me. I'm not, I not loved Kevin. it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's not performative for me. I'm, a, I'm a, the first black woman to lead this organization. This is not performative. It affects my daily lives, my, my daily life, the lives of people that I care and love, um, that I organize with, that I work with, that I live with. Um, you know, it matters that we address social justice and that we address, address real actual equality. Um, but again, justice is not, you know, a, a talking point. And it pains me greatly to hear people who fought for many kinds of justice in the 60s and here we are having to fight the same fight. And sadly, we did not win because here we are again. Uh, so the fight that we have ahead of us is really, really um, huge, but we can do it together and we're going to do it together, but we're gonna do it with a lot, of, a lot more people in the community um, who we are serving first, not going to ask for something, but who are, we are serving first. So that will be the, the, the change that you'll see, the shift from all of the very, very um, <coughs> eloquent yik-yaking to very, uh, very, very uh, pointed uh, action. Uh, that will serve. Can I add one thing to that? Thanks. I think <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to go over. Uh, as we talk about the, the grassroots, I, I did want to highlight there's not as much separation when we talk about our community groups. You know, there used to be a time right. when a group would be only a chapter or affiliate of one of the national organizations, and actually a lot of national orgs had written in their affiliation uh, rules, like you could only affiliate with one because they're like, if we're providing you resources, we don't want you bringing in a, a speaker from a different organization who's gonna make a pitch for membership because then you're t they're taking our members. Now we don't keep so like, Everyone should get all the resources they can to be effective local groups where they are. And you know, it was a joy when we, when we brought in Sam McGuire at American Atheist, for example, she had been running um, an AHA chapter and didn't matter and she volunteered for American Atheist because that's when things had been starting to shift where it was like it doesn't these are not exclusive affiliations mm -hmm. so our local groups and our activists and whatnot like we encourage them to, to find resources anywhere they can when we talk about the different things that they do they might be partnering with Go Humanity on some service projects and uh, the what is the Foundation Beyond Relief Network called now? Go Humanity Network. I don't know. It was no, called something. It is Go GBN. It's still or GHN. Go Humanity Network. Go, go, teams. go teams. Yeah, I knew it was. Yeah, go go teams. Go teams. Um, so yeah, the partnerships look really different now. Very too. Beautiful. So it's like uh, as we think about like service, we're we're talking about our same, not exactly the same, but a big overlap in who the people are that we're trying to help support in this work. Speaking of resources, we must consider the Great Emu War, as that is the touchstone for our presentation. The emus had few uh, resources in comparison to the humans, but they were still able to succeed. What resources do your organizations have for local activists, state level organizations, local organizations that you'd really like to talk about that we can take better advantage of? We, speaker bureaus. So we, well, mm, I'm not sure about speaker bureaus. We do have that. Um, <laughs> uh, we could also take a quick, as someone who's in many speaker bureaus and never gives speeches. <laughs> OK, 
you could, could talk about that. I have to call on you a little more then. Uh, we we have a huge social media presence. One, we have our optics are off the chart. It's a, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, so that's the one thing. One of the many things that we have. We also have a very well resourced membership, uh, meaning that they tend to be somewhat affluent. Um, so we have some funding that's available. And as I was talking with my deputy director Nicole earlier today, you know, partnering them, for example to adopt like an SSA chapter could go very well for an SSA chapter. Um, you know, having someone in an AHA chapter sponsor an event, for example. So we have we have resources that are kind of out there in the world. We don't we just haven't organized them properly. Um, we are working on raising millions of dollars um, to grant out to people and that is probably the biggest thing that I'm hoping to affect in the next two years is bringing in that kind of money that we can simply just grant out to folks in the secular community, but also people who are doing really good work in the community, um, you know, around repro justice, you know, housing justice, disability justice, whatever the thing is. If it needs funding and you're a good organization and you can reasonably account for where the money is going, then we'd love to help fund you. Um, so that, that would be it for us for, for now. But we, we have a lot of really great resources as far as, again, optics. So if you, you've got some ideas, you'd like to share them, we have a magazine, we have lots of places to publish things, please send them to Nicole, <laughs> who would be thrilled to read them. Uh, and we'd be thrilled to, to publish them out. Uh, for this uh, Secular Student Alliance, clearly a lot of our resources are uh, geared towards and intentional for uh, students. Um, and almost everything that we provide to our student chapters and individual students is free for them. So we do tabling supplies and business cards and banners and yard signs, things for them to publicize their self on campus. Um, we do do some grant funding uh, for programs that, larger programs that they want to do on their individual campuses. Um, and then we also have a scholarship program which we have uh, humanist groups and atheist groups who in, in a variety of cities across or a variety of states across the United States who are sponsoring those um, to help us with that and so they then they we run the program and they then get to pick the their recipients in their state and those sorts of things and we love those partnerships um, so we try to do we try to do that as much as possible we also have a conference would actually just finished or we, it was we were really hoping to be in personal actually in person this year just actually right down the street um, at the University of um, Missouri uh, st. Louis we will be there next year on July no June 16 through 18 um, so I we negotiated that right before this conference started. Um, so it's, and that's one of the largest gathering of secular students anywhere in the United States is when they come together. It's a lot of leadership development uh, and really grassroots sort of development for them. Um, but sort of a unique opportunity for them to get to see people all across the United States who are doing, who think like them and are doing the same things they're doing. And for the students, it's really super empowering. Um, we also will provide, uh, uh, supplies and those sorts of things to local groups so if they're doing tabling and those sort of things and want some stuff that's geared for younger folk um, we are happy to uh, do that we'd love it when you make a donation after we send that to you I will admit as well um, but we very much do that and I think the other thing is somewhat a little bit tangentially um, and this was I think very obvious pre-COVID there was um, well I think if you look at this conference you know SSA alum, SSA alum, SSA alum, like this room is filled with them. Out of curiosity, can we get a hands up if you were in SSA? Yeah. That's pretty good. <coughs> so, I'm, uh, so group alum that wasn't SSA. Yeah. <laughs> the other organization, <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, <laughs> kidding. I was, was going to make a slide. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> I was, uh, no. um, Those are earlier troubles. It was, yeah. It was 20 years ago yeah. troubles. <clears throat> We and then 10 years ago, <laughs> troubles. Uh, but with one of the things that, uh, that was really obvious with pre-pandemic, and over almost every single organi secular organization, there was an SSA alumni either employed or doing internships or practical, you know, those are things involved. Um, and so that was a great thing. And we very much look for, we know we want to, we work with Camp Quest and so, uh, getting students from Camp Quest to join SSAs when they leave the, their campers uh, age group 
a lot of our students go and actually volunteer for Camp Quest and being LTs, so leadership within and helping them run that. Um, and we really look that we want to be a, a bridge from outside of college back in those local communities and involvement with the national groups. Um, so we have some fantastic students that we put a lot of resources into as far as leadership development, those sorts of things. And we want them to be activists in the future about what their passions are. And that can be lots of different things. If they want to be environmental activists, yay, we're going to support them in that. We also want them to stay involved in the larger secular community and be activists and be active in that realm as well. And I think that's a, one of the things we really look at providing to the secular movement. And I will make a side note on that. Um, and I often, when I talk with groups, I often, and I have also, Dottie and I have also had this conversation. Um, when local groups, and when you think of your individual membership in your local groups, and who comes to those meetings. So for our population of students that we work with, um, right now about 50% are, are male and female. And this is our, our memberships in leadership and in membership, our demographics in leadership and membership are very similar. So about 50% male, 50% female. And I will say the female is, is growing. Uh, as a, it will soon, I think, be a higher percentage. Um, about 40% of our students identify as, um, as uh, students of color or mixed race, self-identify. Uh, about 20% of our students identify as, as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. Another 5%, and this is growing, I think, as well, um, as trans or gender nonconforming. So when you think of our group and you think of the, a lot of the national groups and the local groups, there's a huge disparity there in what we want our students to see themselves and feel represented in those groups, and that is crucially important. Uh, and we can't do that alone. We need everyone in the in the movement to help create that possibility. You're always so resistant. I'm not resistant. I'm putting my thoughts together. Uh, I know there are a lot of long time, old timers, <laughs> old timers here. So a summary, if you contact us um, at American Atheists and you say, we want a table at Pride, we want a table at a local event, we want to do a march and a rally, we'll send you a box of stuff. Everyone send a box of stuff. We have rally signs and things at the table that you can see. We'll help uh, give you some guidance if you're not sure what you might use or how to use it. We'll give you some guidance. We often ask for something like tabling at Pride. It's cool if you offer a free American Atheist membership that can encourage people, and then we'll give them a free membership and send them a magazine and some other stuff in a card, and it's pretty cool. But also, then they can march on the parade with cool signs and say they're atheists and have rainbow designs on them. Um, we also are happy to share advice. Come to us. That's a thing that a lot of people don't take advantage of, but those who do, I think, benefit greatly. If we can't figure out the answer to your question to help guide you after, with the kind of collected years of experience that we have, because some things are out of our experience. We haven't dealt with everything that's come up ever. Uh, but often we know who else we can connect you with or talk to you to get information to help people in this specific situation they're in. So that kind of information, you might not find a resource on the website, but people do contact us trying to figure out how to to do something effectively on the ground where they are, or to get their group to do something, to respond to something where they are. And we can often help follow up and you know, provide some information, figure out who to connect you with that might be able to help you where you are, things like that. Oh, there was not a, it's like the coffee hasn't kicked in yet. <laughs> um, oh, I, I did want to mention, and this kind of relates to the earlier question, when we talk about the needs of our, our community, one of the projects that American Atheists has uh, done, led by my colleague Allison Gill, our Vice President for Legal and Policy, who was also hired in 2018, is a data collection project. Partly this is, a, actually she used to work for the Human Rights Campaign some years ago. She spent a lot of time before coming to American Atheists working for different LGBTQ advocacy organizations and led their data collection project. She also worked on the National Center for Transgender Equality's massive, influential uh, trans survey in 2015, which I still see referenced in articles all over the place. Um, and so coming into movement atheism, she's like, we don't have the kind of data that we could use effectively for advocacy when we can show numbers and impacts and effects on things. Um, so coming from these other communities, like why don't we do something like that here? 
And we did. We raised a bunch of money because it costs a lot of money to do big surveys. Um, she was expecting we might get maybe like 5,000 responses to the online survey we did. And I was like, no, atheists really like giving their opinion. And they're like, yeah, maybe. <laughs> we love forms. She was like, maybe we'll get 10,000. And I was like, I don't think there'll be any problem hitting these numbers. I mean, if, if our bloggers push it out, if the other national orgs push it out, we're sharing data, it's kind of co-sponsored. And the day that it launched, I think we got 18,000 by the end of the day, and they're like, no one could have seen this coming. And I was like, excuse me, <laughs> uh, the person who's worked in this community and knows how surveys have gone, and they're like, but it costs us a dollar per survey. Oops. <laughs> so we need to cut it off early. And I was like, oh, well, you didn't tell me that, because I would have pushed more that there were going to be more responses. So when we hit like 33, 34,000, we're like, we have to stop. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> we closed it. Our survey was really successful. No one could have seen this. And I was like, ahem. Yes. <laughs> Atheists really love when they get asked about themselves. So. So we got a really big, like never been done before at this size uh, survey um, with an interesting bunch of data and large enough that we could slice and dice into some smaller uh, communities or subgroups. Some we weren't able to hit well, like we have some data about like ex-Muslims, but not enough where we can say with confidence like big conclusions about ex-Muslims. The most useful thing, because it's a self-selecting survey, it wasn't random samples, it was like, hey, please fill this out is comparing the different groups who took the survey against each other. So like, how did younger people respond in contrast to older people? How about people who have become an atheist more recently versus those who have been an atheist forever? Those in the South versus those in the North or the West? You know, which states said that they've suffered the most discrimination? Um, what about black people versus white people and that kind of thing? Uh, women versus men. And so not only did we put out the big main report, which is on secularsurvey.org, We've also been able to do, um, what are we up to, four? We're about to launch our fourth um, specific population report. We've done young people. We've done black atheists, black non-religious Americans. We've done women. And we're about to launch in two weeks, three weeks, LGBTQ. Uh, secular Americans and see where some differences lie. The information is fascinating. Again, you can find that on secularsurvey.org. But some of the places that were, again, interesting were like where the differences are. Abortion and repro was a top issue, but it was way more a top issue for the women who responded I than the why. men, as you would expect. And seeing those kinds of differences highlighted, um, you know, see how many people were interested in schools as, as a major thing, like secular schools being a, a very important point, and actually how few people were interested in like um, religious displays, which is kind of cool, because there's not much we can do about those now with our current judiciary. So if that was like a number th one thing, it's like, oh no, there's a lack of alignment here, but that was good. But yeah, again, like being informed by that kind of information across the organizations, yeah. say like, you know, this is where we kind of thought we were going, according to this data we get from people we were able to take the survey with a lot of people. Like, yes, let's go there. We see that there, that's where interest and, uh, and need is. So that was another thing um, I wanted to mention. And as we talk about, like, hey, if you have ideas and bring them to us, yes. <laughs> we like that. We like, we like feedback um, and input and ideas. It really helps us to do what we're trying to do uh, effectively to think about different ways that we could do this, especially as you know, times are always changing and the tools that are out there that are available to organizations are always changing as well. That's my Excellent. Did I miss anything? No. Webinars. <laughs> I was like, there was something else. Webinars. Uh, American Atheists has, has been doing training webinars for our local group leaders and state directors. And basically, when the quarantine started, it was a month before our conference was supposed to happen in Phoenix uh, in 2020. And it was like, oops, we canceled a conference four weeks before it happened. That's hard. And so we decided to bring in like speaker events um, as webinar events. And I know AHA has been doing webinars, and SSA has been doing webinars and social events online. And that's a good resource for all different kinds of people to get involved or to get connected uh, better. It's been our comment community for the webinars is hopping. <laughs> it is really, really active. People are glad to see each other. It's a good way for people to come in. We just did a town hall where you, people were able to ask questions of leadership. And it was like really fun. And we're thinking of doing those more often. So there's also webinars as a resource and training resources too online. Uh, we're sort of sorting that out with the new website uh, that we're working on, but 
there will be more training resources for community leaders and local activists online on the American Atheist site. Fantastic. Thanks. We're about That's at cool. our halfway point. Yep. So I have a fun intermission-ish activity. Mm -hmm. It's not actually an intermission, but it is a fun activity. Uh, so in the same way that emus are not uh, negatively impacted by machine guns mounted on trucks, <laughs> fun fact about the emu war, uh, we are not affected by our past strives, strifes or hardships in our community. We want to continue to grow, and I've already noticed that everyone has talked about other organizations that do work that they appreciate, other niches that are filled. So we're gonna do a rapid style, say an organization and what, what it is they, they do, and then the person to your left will go next, and whoever can go longest it's a special prize. I feel like that's the opposite of what we should do. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go to the like, right? Do you want to, I mean, just going long, you know? We have an hour and a half. No, this is not. Yeah, I mean, well, we don't have These to. These are the chatty, it's going to be like 30 minutes from coming. Well, I, <laughs> so <laughs> let's go with uh, big organizations that people in the audience or people watching from home would be saying, oh, that's cool. I could use that. In 60 seconds. In 60 seconds. No. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll go quick. Start on the other side. Okay. Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Kevin. Sure. So um, I would say the Freedom from Religion Foundation, as we've already mentioned a little bit, has a wonderful floor of lawyers um, and who are super, super supportive of our students whenever there's a problem, but also for the general community. Um, and so an excellent, excellent resource on separation of church and state and experts in that area and super quick and lovely for that. Um, I know she already had a little bit, but um, American Atheist and their state program is just kicking ass. Um, and uh, you sort of have to pull out Allison as well. Um, Allison, their lobbyist and lawyer, who is amazing. Um, so we are also we're also collaborating with them. We sued the Department of Education. Um, so they also are representing. Uh, and, uh, and Americans United for a separation of state, while not in the secular community, super supportive, always there to help, uh, and things like that as well. Um, I mentioned the camps already, so Camp Quest, um, which is always good. We, with uh, Go Humanity, um, we actually do a secular spring break, so we were in uh, Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, we were in the Bahamas after Dorian, we were supposed to be in Louisiana, but that got canceled to COVID. Um, but we are scheduled for next uh, uh, spring to do a group where we take a group out and they actually do an entire week of um, disaster rebuilding and, and those sorts of things. So um, great group there. Um, I was trying to think of something for CFI. But. So my intent was <laughs> one <laughs> and then the left. But that's okay. Nadia, go. <laughs> Other Kevin orcs. said all the things. Uh, he did say many. He said yeah. all of the things, honestly. Um, I have had the most wonderful interactions with Americans United uh, for separation of church and state. Yep. They are working on a, a document for students, as a matter of fact, for oh. the fall, uh, so that students can know their rights because they're being shit on wholesale in schools. So there will be a document that they're creating. We're going to be sharing it out through our, uh, through our channels also. Um, but they're always so easy to work with, and they're so smart. And Andrew Seidel also was such a champ to come and speak at our conference. Uh, he's lovely, and his wife Liz is also wonderful. And to his to his admission, smarter than he is, uh, he said so. I, I'm not saying that. Uh, but anyway, Liz is lovely, and love the fact that our attorneys together have a podcast. Uh, so Liz, Rebecca, uh, Monica, and uh, Allison. Uh, called We Dissent. They film it on Tuesdays. Uh, that coincides with our staff meeting. We never see our staff attorney <laughs> on the day of the recording. Um, but they have a fantastic podcast. With I had no idea. The four of them. Oh, it's fantastic. It's you good. should absolutely listen. So it's called We Dissent. Um, so again, American, uh, American atheists are amazing. We love working with you all. Um, Again, the lobby day was fantastic, and we thoroughly enjoy just talking shit with you because you're just so much fun. Um, just in general. It's gross how much we love each other. I know, <laughs> it's so much fun, we're like a family. Um, interestingly enough, the Camp Quest, um, I had a wonderful, wonderful conversation with Sarah. It's really, really looking forward to working more closely with them, but also with Amy at Camp 42. 
um, which are the camps that are in the southeast part of the United States. I've not had a chance to have a, have a conversation with her, but I'm looking forward to forging those uh, that relationship. And then again, as I say, we love you. What are we? What are we if we're not investing in our young people? And we're ineffective, is what we are. If we're not investing in our young people, so uh, I think that's all I have. I Debbie, all the people. any others? Yeah. Uh, not repeat. Black non-believers. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Headquartered in Atlanta, Mandisa Thomas, who is on both the American Humanist Association Board mm -hmm. and American Atheists Board, um, and has spoken at conferences and events and is willing to speak uh, at anyone's event. She has a lot of great things to say. They have a network of groups. Um, they have several groups across the country and a conference coming up in September that they're one of the organizations sponsoring called Women of Color Beyond Belief. It's going to be in Chicago last weekend of September into October. Yep. Check it out. I think it's their fourth, fourth conference. Mm -hmm. Third conference. It'll be great. It'll be great. It'll be great. It'll be great. And you should totally go. Also, uh, Chicago. secular women. Hello. Hello. Yeah. I, was, I was coming back around to that yeah. one. Hello. Second woman, second yeah, woman. Hello. Stephanie's here. Uh, and because we're in St. Louis, too, uh, the American Ethical Union, which works really differently, their religion, a non-theistic religion, sort of came out of Judaism almost 150 years ago. Uh, they have about two dozen different congregations across the US. Uh, maybe a third of those, half of those, are like larger old ones with big buildings and such. They tend to have an older membership. Um, it used to be very, very active and, and a thriving movement 100 years ago. Things change. And they have some newer groups, and they have some younger people involved who, are, who have been working to make it be more active because there's, again, a lot of resources, information, interesting structure, and as we have increasing numbers of non-religious people, there are certainly people who are looking for a home, who sort of miss the kind of community that church can bring, who miss getting together in groups and singing with people. I don't miss that. So I'm kind of scared. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want singing at my lecture. Don't make me sing. Old hippie songs, I don't, I don't get it. Um, <laughs> doesn't make me feel good. It's either I want like drinks and karaoke, or I want like lectures and activism. and. I have a hard time when they try to mix up. But other people really, really, really like that. Uh, and if that's your bag, um, the largest of the ethical societies is here in St. Louis, somewhere. Yep. I don't know where. There, it's a cool building, too. So the American Ethical Union is interesting to check out. They also have a very strong like social change, social justice uh, commitment. They've been putting a lot of their videos online, uh, different talks that run, like AHA, like a yeah, huge huge realm of um, different ideas. And not everyone is an atheist there, too, because they are a, a, a non-theistic religion that says deed, not creed. So it's more be about the actions you take than your beliefs. This thing like, there might be space for more people to get into that in the future as, as we see how non-religion evolves, where it's not necessarily atheism and it's not necessarily organized against um, dominant religions in our, in our society. You had more to fill in? I, I was, I was going to do, uh, I actually thought of this yesterday when we were doing the storytelling. Um, uh, and so th this is my opportunity now when I have a little mic now. Uh, but just is, is a is just nice little shout out and thank you to Secretary Woman. So when I started the position, um, I was not aware of some of SSA's um, past and history and some of the damage that it allowed to be happened to students. Um, that just hit me. Um, but uh, fortunately, I had some uh, some good people who sat, who I, who allowed me to call them, um, and who allowed uh, to sort of share some information with me that I think allowed me to make some very smart decisions in our organization moving forward. Um, and I also had to contact some former students and apologize, um, which was difficult. Um, but that is something that we are committed to never having happen again. And I had a um, a very strong conversation with our board uh, about that as well. And so that's a commitment that we continue um, in, in this. And so I thank them for uh, their sharing and allowing me in on an area that they did not have to let me in on. So that was very sweet. Um, so, uh, but I would say um, on a happier note, 
Um, we, we uh, last semester, spring semester, we reached out to, directly reached out to 1.4 million students across the United States. Um, and so we picked some of the largest college universities, public in the state, and actually emailed every single student on campus. Um, some we text, and there's a couple that we actually mailed stuff to their house because we didn't have email addresses. Um, so, and we realized we're hitting religious students and non-religious students. When, when you get the entire campus, that's what you do. Uh, but just a great, uh, it was in a very, we took it as a very approach to normalize non-religion. Um, and it's just a way, one, we didn't want a lot of spams because um, we want to continue to be able to do this. So, but really, we use that opportunity, and then, of course, to educate about what we're doing. Uh, as we move forward into the fall, we're actually working with AHA and Black Nonbelievers, and we're doing an intentional and specific outreach, which will probably be the largest direct outreach the secular movement has done to historically black college and universities. Um, and then after that, in the spring, we're going to actually be hitting his, uh, Hispanic-serving institutions and going back and hitting some of the, um, some of the other big college and universities that we have not been able to hit um, previously. And this will be something that we continue to do. Um, is, and the organization has not really done direct in your face outreach um, before, but very educational um, and just really trying to normalize that and really find our people. Humanist International. <laughs> do they count? Yeah. Sure. They're not part of the Secular Coalition for America because they're international. <laughs> but Humanist International has been around since, 19, I should know this, 1952. Yes, because this is the 70th anniversary year, and I did math. So. <laughs> You did the math. I did. They started kind of with a UN attitude of like the whole world coming together as a network. American Humanist Association was one of the founding organizations because AHA has been around since 1941. Long time. Um, and uh, UK won a bunch of groups from all over the place. AHA and American Atheists are members. I think as to say as an associate member. That's it. I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure, <laughs> but the point is, uh, we we've we've gone to conferences, we've met some activists from around the world. The U.S. is in a, a f interesting position, as you can imagine. We're very powerful. We have a lot of resources here. Sometimes we dominate the spaces we're in. We're not running uh, Human International, but I am on the board. Uh, however, also, to be fair, we have an outsized impact on everyone, <laughs> the whole world. And that includes with us sending one of our biggest imports of uh, evangelical Christianity to muck up the law in a lot of other countries around the world. And that includes in Ghana, where organizations like the Alliance Defending Freedom have worked to implement new laws criminalizing LGBTQ people which has resulted in murders and deaths and attacks, including on humanist groups. Thanks, United States. Thanks, ADF. That includes in Russia, where organizations like ADF have been working to help strengthen the relationship between the government and the Orthodox uh, Church there in Poland and other parts in Eastern Europe, other African countries, in places like Argentina and such, where they strongly defend um, laws criminalizing abortion, or in some cases push new laws to criminalize these things. And so the relationship and, and like American organizations working with international groups is not just because it's like, oh, it's funsies, like let's, what are you doing over there? This is what we're doing over here. But no, it's because we in the US have an impact all over the world. If we can successfully fight organizations like the Alliance Defending Freedom in the US, that has international impact on marginalized uh, people everywhere, and so they're very interested in working with us and seeing us be successful here. We're interested in partnering with them and learning more, sharing resources, sharing information, learning more about how things work as we also try to do better at organizing with different communities uh, in the U.S. and seeing different options that we have for how to do the work that we want to do. Um, so the thing that we're excited in the future to talk about involves some closer relationships and partnerships and events working with Humanist International. I'm also hoping that we can bring in um, at least one or maybe a couple speakers from Humanist International to our next 
American Atheist Conference too, which will be in Phoenix in April 2023, April 7th through 9th. Uh, but <laughs> the uh, Alliance Defending Freedom um, is headquartered in Scottsdale, Arizona. And so it would be neat if we could have, even if it's via video, like someone from Ghana who's doing humanist activism working with LGBTQ groups, who can talk about like the new laws in Ghana that have, um, and how that affects people on the ground, like friends who've been attacked, you know, new laws that criminalize some of their activities. She does a lot of LGBTQ activism too, um, for example. So that's uh, some partnerships I think that really, again, have an outsized impact on how things look in the kind of work that we want to do for change. Sorry. Very good. <laughs> so uh, 